what we call smell is composed of chemical particles called molecules which evaporate from objects. For instance, what we perceive as the scent of freshly ground coffee is actually molecules from the coffee itself flying through the air. Now, the intensity of the smell is directly proportional with the intensity of evaporation. A just-baked cake fresh out of the oven gives out a much richer scent than a stale one. This is because the cake's molecules are flying very freely through the air due to its oven-baked heat. And molecules can cover a very large area when they are released. Although many molecules have a smell, water does not. And this characteristic is a great blessing for us, for it prevents many problems. For instance, a dry rose and a rose with water drops on it smell exactly the same. What distinguishes various smells from each other are differences in their structures. These differences are so delicate that through the change of a single carbon atom, a pleasant smell might be turned into a repulsive one. The smells of different foods are the result of a particular order of bonds between atoms that form the smell molecules. Each molecule is planned to perform a task. Of course, this excellent design was created by God. But how do we smell, and how do we recognize smells? Now let's find answers to these questions. Every time we breathe, the gaseous mixture of trillions of molecules we call air floods into our nostrils. Also contained within this air mix are microscopic smell molecules. Some of the air that enters our noses is channeled into the olfactory receptors by turbinate bones. It's in this way that the smell molecules reach the olfactory receptors at the top part of the nose. The receptors in this area in turn send the information they get from these molecules to the brain and the brain's smell center gathers messages from various smell receptors and assesses this information at lightning speed. This leads to the sensation which we perceive as smell. Briefly, the nose works like a chemical analysis laboratory. It is so sensitive that it can recognize up to 10,000 separate odors. What's quite interesting is the breathtaking speed of all these processes. The time between the coffee molecules entering our nostrils and our recognizing their smell is far less than a second. This flawless system obviously cannot be the result of a series of coincidences, as the evolutionists would have us believe. Like all the other systems of the human body, the sense of smell is also an extremely complex design. 
This is God's art of creation. In our day, ongoing research is being conducted into the sense of smell. Every new insight into this sense serves to reveal just how superb this complex system is. Now let's examine more closely the various parts of the system. The nasal cavity that detects smell is just beneath the eyes and is lined with a sticky mucus fluid. This mucous membrane measures just six hundredth of a millimeter thick, which is ideal. If this membrane were thicker, we would have a weaker sense of smell. But if it were thinner, it would have weakened our immune system, and our tiny nasal hairs would have left open to damage and destruction. Smelling starts at the mucous membrane. The smell molecules have to pass through this membrane in order to meet with the receptors in the nasal hairs. And there are binding proteins made just for this purpose. These proteins in the mucous membrane unite with the smell molecules and serve as their guide. This order is both striking and at the same time constitutes evidence of an amazing creation. Specialized olfactory nerve cells are another part of the smelling system. The basic task of these cells is to take messages from smell molecules and take them to the olfactory bulbs. A smell cell is formed by three main parts. The cell's body in the middle, and then on one end, tiny hairs called cilia, and on the other, nerve extensions called axons. The odor molecules first interact with the receptors on the hair-like cilia of our olfactory membrane. Each olfactory neuron is topped by between 10 and 30 cilia, which range in length from about a tenth of a millimeter to a fifteenth. The cilia work using an extraordinary communication mechanism. The odor molecules that melt in the mucus meet with the special receptors in the cilia. This meeting is as sensitive and unique as a lock and a key. During this meeting, a signal is given in the olfactory receptor cell. These cells transform the messages in the olfactory molecules into electrical signals. At this point, astonishing things happen at the axons on the other end of the smell cell. The axons, whose number ranges between 10 and 100, work together in order to transport the signal in the cell to the olfactory bulb inside the brain. They do this by forming a bundle in order to reach the olfactory bulb, and as a group, pass through a porous, paper-thin piece of bone called the cribriform plate. It would be no exaggeration to call the special design of the cribriform plate a miracle. This bone has pores in it which allow the passage of the olfactory neurons. Had the bone not been designed in just this way, it would have been impossible for the nerves to connect to each other, and so would have made smelling utterly impossible, even if all the other pieces of the system were right in place. By virtue of this perfect planning behind all the details of our smell system, communication in the smell cells goes off without any hitches. The olfactory bulb is another important part of the olfactory or smell system. The olfactory bulb lies on the front side of the brain, on top of the nasal cavity, concealed upon the brain case. There are two olfactory lobes in the brain, just as the nose has two nasal cavities. Each of these lobes is about as big as a pea. The olfactory lobes work like a newsroom at a TV station or newspaper. All the signals coming in from the olfactory receptors first gather in this center. Millions of pieces of information are reorganized here. Later, they are sent to the related spots in the brain through smell nerves in order to be reassessed. In other words, this tiny organ constantly sorts through and coordinates millions of different smell cells. This perfect system is obviously an extraordinary piece of work. Its design shows God's art of creation. Anyone seeking the origin of such an excellent design in a mere chain of coincidences will be running a fool's errand. In the Quran, 
God explains how a wise person would respond to such people. Do you then disbelieve in him who created you from dust, then from a drop of sperm, and then formed you as a man? He is, however, God, my Lord, and I will not associate anyone with my Lord. When someone says the word nose, we all naturally think of the sense of smell. However, studies have shown that actually only 5% of our noses are used towards picking up smells. The remaining 95% perform two very important jobs of the respiratory system. The first of these tasks is to warm up and moisten the air which we take in every second. The mucus layer that covers the inside of the nose humidifies the air by giving out water vapor. The capillaries right under this mucus layer help to warm the air running through this passage. This way, the air becomes suitable for our sensitive lungs. This mechanism works like a very advanced air conditioning system that regulates the temperature and humidity of the air. The second task of the nose is to act as a gatekeeper against microbes and dust particles carried by the air which we breathe in. These potentially harmful particles get caught by the mucus layer and then the hair-like cilia. Then the mucus laden with harmful substances is pushed by the cilia to the pharynx. Later, it is expelled from the body by coughing or else swallowed and then destroyed by acids in the stomach. The mucus layer mucus producing cells and cilia work like a personal chemical purification power plant built right into our noses. You can clearly see that these systems in our noses are an example of unparalleled engineering and yet further evidence of God's perfect creation. God explains his power of creation like this in the Quran. Everything in the heavens and earth belongs to him. Everything is obedient to him the originator of the heavens and earth. When he decides on something, he just says to it, Be, and it is.